My name is Jenny Rose Halperin. I'm the director of Library Futures, which is a project of the NYU Engelberg Center. So I actually think of open access and open glam as being slightly different, but also highly related fields. So open access, when I think about open access, I think more about sort of open access to science, open access to research, uh, open access to um, culturally created um, materials that are are maybe more recent. When I think about open glam, I think about um, the ways in which uh, communities and institutions make available the cultural riches that have already been created um, and that are in many ways sort of um, culturally dependent or specific. And I and I also want to add a corollary that. You know, one of the things that I think um, I've learned about open glam and that I think a lot of people have started to, to think about with open glam is that I feel like a lot of us operated, particularly, you know, white people in the global north have operated under the assumption that open glam is, is sort of good on its face. But for many cultures and communities, op openness is inappropriate or, um, you know, not, um, not right. And so uh, when I think about the benefits of, of open glam, I think about, you know, the power and benefit in reuse, in reuse, in remix of culture. Um, you know, one of the things that I love about the internet and that I love about uh, the information age is that it allows us to do things that we have not been able to do in the past. So while in the past, the way that people would discover materials might have been through a library catalog or a library or an institutional catalog or they would have had to buy a book. Now, you know, people can see great works of art at their um, at their fingertips. And at the same time, you know, the prophecy of, of Benjamin has never been more relevant, right? It's very difficult to represent those materials in digital space in the same way that people might experience them in physical space and the aura is lost and there's too much material and it's kind of hard to know. But at the same time, I think it's really important and really incredible um, that so much material is available to people irrespective of copyright in particular. Um, and that, um, you know, anything that you want to discover is, is discoverable. Um, that being said, I'm, I'm really interested in the ways in which libraries and institutions can use better findability, can use better searchability, um, and, you know, sort of spaces of innovation that we don't yet know in AI and machine learning and um, other forms of technology that will really augment uh, people's experience of open glam uh, beyond just like a JPEG on a screen. Well, so copyright is one, right? Copyright is a, is a, big issue uh, for libraries and for archives um, and museums. Uh, this is not to say that copyright is bad. Copyright is good, but I, I think one of the copyright is very good. It's something I'm very interested in. Um, it's very important. But, you know, I think that uh, the CC licenses in particular as a corollary to copyright is something that sits on top of copyright, I think can provide a very powerful tool, a very interesting tool to be able to to open up uh, culture, even though that's not necessarily what the CC licenses were created to do. Um, I think that that has proven to be a really important use case um, for open culture and possibly the most important use case for, for open digital culture. Uh, but in terms of barrier, um, you know, it's uh, institutional size, it's um, will, it's uh, money, um, and um, it's also risk. Um, I think risk is a really understated question within open glam. You know, the public domain exists for us to celebrate it. It exists, it is, risk, it is rich, it is robust. 
should be protected, it should be grown and built. And so CC0 licenses, for example, can really provide that or CC by license on a piece of art that doesn't necessarily have the same kind of monetary value, I think can provide a really, really rich and important text from which uh, institutions can um, draw. But I think ultimately the questions of risk of funding and of institutional and political will um, are the three largest barriers. One of the things that I was interested in in graduate school, which was, of course, 10 years ago, uh, was the difficulty of representing museums in digital space. And I still think about that problem all the time about how, you know, um, the experience that I might have looking at a, um, a Gauguin on a screen is extremely different from the experience of seeing, you know, um, where are we going in, in massive at the Museum of Fine Arts or, um, you know, I, I, I it, it is not, not the same. And so when somebody told me that many, many years ago, um, that's the first thing that comes to mind is, is just how much that problem has not been solved and whether it's a solvable problem and whether or not it's one that we want to invest invest in. Um, I think the coolest manifestation of a fix that I've seen is something called Google Cardboard, which was popular for about five minutes. Um, but it was really cool because they were building museum spaces that you could literally walk around and you could move your head and you could look around. And that felt very real and it was cheap, right? It was just your phone. Um, with a pair of glasses on. But I think that that question of how do we represent museums in digital space with the multitude of uh, open content that exists, um, I think is something that um, that I think about a lot. The other thing that actually, as I'm, as I'm talking to you, that somebody said to me a long time ago is that, um, which I think is actually more usable for the series, <laughs> is that in some ways, because of the magnitude of their collections, museums are very much in the business of hiding things, whereas archives are in the business of making things findable and seeable. Um, and so one of the powers of Open Glam is it particularly makes collections that may not be on display, uh, often for political reasons, like, you know, how many Monet, exhibits are probably going on in this country in the United States at any given time, right? Um, but um, it, it really is a, is a powerful tool to make collections that have not historically been seeable, uh, very seeable uh, to the general public. And I think that that's powerful. And that's also a true paradigm shift for museums, because, you know, rather than having to rely on art history slides or you know, their, their magnitudes of collections, um, museums are able to um, really make available and make widely known um, materials that uh, may not have necessarily been findable and discoverable by the public historically. So I do want to point out that the people who are uh, in an institution are people who are workers and, um, you know, the question of hesitation is is ultimately very much a human question. Um, it's often a question of education uh, on what the power of open glam can provide. It's a question of copyright, of risk. It's something that we do a lot at Library Futures is trying to help people feel more comfortable around um, questions of copyright and questions of 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 openness. Um, I think that you know anything uh, that would that would be opened um, would have to begin with a risk analysis. Um, I also will plug a project uh, at the Engelberg Center where I work called the Glam eLab, which exists as a, a set of legal advice and a set of just advice generally uh, for institutions to make it easier um, to help them open up their collection. But one of the things that you might actually discover is that, for example, compliance and licensing and rights is more expensive than open than open collections. And 
open collections, for example, at the Smithsonian provide an enormous amount of wealth and cultural wealth to people. So I do, but I do think it's a question of education and I, I do encourage anybody who's thinking about it to reach out uh, to the, to the GLAM eLab at the Engelberg Center uh, for support in opening up collections.